As always, great to see you guys. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Glad you're here with us. And um, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to Ezekiel chapter 26. And um, I'll pray as you guys are finding your way there to Ezekiel and ask God to bless our time. So Lord, we thank you for what you're going to show us tonight in Ezekiel. Um, Lord, the way you dealt with the uh, city of Tyre and the way you deal, Lord, with all those um, who rebel against you, rebel against your people, and allow themselves to be used by the enemy. And a lot of great insight tonight, behind the scenes as well, and we thank you for that. I just pray your word, Lord, would come alive in our hearts, and um, you would block out everything else that would interfere with our thoughts. Let us focus in on you now and on your word during this time, and you by your spirit would make that happen, Lord. You are the teacher, and your spirit, Lord, is what quickens us, the word we can understand it. So, Lord, work by your spirit now. Do that for us tonight. We want to hear from you. And uh, pour out your spirit on this place and on us. And we thank you, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we get into chapter 26 tonight, we're going to see, actually, I'd like to try to cover three chapters if we can. Sometimes I can do even more than that. We've done like, quite a few more than that, but these are, have a lot of stuff in them. So I'm not sure I can do it, but I'd like to, and here's why. These next three chapters deal with the city of Tyre. I'd like to cover all of that at one time because it just flows together so well. But the city of Tyre was up north of Israel. It's what we call it in modern day Lebanon today. The ancient city of Tyre no longer exists. There is a city of Tyre that is still there, but it's not in the same location. Um, and um, uh, the original location and the ancient city of Tyre no longer exists and hasn't existed for uh, uh, thousands of years. So uh, it's pretty much gone. But again, we're going to see him talk about Tyre and why God judged them. Uh, then we'll see him get into the, uh, the prince of Tyre, that is the leader of Tyre, and his attitude and his heart uh, that God had to judge. Then we're going to get to the king of Tyre, which is the spiritual aspect behind all of it. And we're going to get, you know, there's these certain passages in scripture, you kind of get a peek behind the scenes, in, in more in depth of the spirit realm uh, about certain things. And we'll, if we get there, we'll get more uh, in depth about uh, Satan. Our, our, our adversary, if you will. But let's jump into it and see if we can make it that far tonight. Notice in chapter 26, verse 1, it says, It came to pass in the 11th year of the first day of the month that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, because Tyre has said against Jerusalem, Aha, she is broken, who was the gateway of the peoples. Now she is turned over to me, and I shall be filled. She is laid waste. Now remember what happened to all the other nations that said, Aha, we've got Israel now, and they were happy when Israel was, was falling. Remember what happened to them? They're all destroyed. We talked about that last week. Every city or nation that rejoices at the demise of Israel or fights against Israel, God says, you're fighting against me. And so I'm going to bring you down if you do that. And so we saw that happen with uh, Ammon and Moab and, and Edom. God says, I'm going to judge you because you're fighting against Israel because you're rejoicing in Israel's fall. I'm going to bring you down. Um, again, the Philistines were completely removed from the face of the planet. They no longer exist because of their rejoicing and the length of time they rejoiced at the demise of Israel. And now we see Tyre also jumping in, uh, another neighbor of Israel saying, aha, well, we're glad you're falling. We're glad you're doing bad. It's good to see you go and, you know, do away with the Jews, do away with Israel, let them go down. And so we're rejoicing. God says, oh, really? Really? Okay, now you're dealing with me, God would say. And that's not a good thing. And so what, he says, therefore, because you're doing this, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you. You don't want to ever God say that. I am against you, O Tyre, and will cause many nations to come up against you as the sea causes its waves to come up, and they shall destroy the walls of Tyre, break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. So I'm just scrape the place flat, wipe it out. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. That is, the fishermen can throw their nets on the rocks and dry them out and work on them, but there'll be no city there. For I have spoken, says the Lord God, it shall become plunder for the nations. So everybody will take all their stuff when they take them away. Also, her daughter villages, that is, the towns around Tyre, which are in the fields, shall be slain by the sword, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So he kind of pronounces overall, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to wipe you out. I mean, literally, all the rocks, everything, your buildings, I'm going to get rid of them. Scrape them off the land. The land will be flat. There won't even be, just everything's going to be gone. The foundation, all that's going to be scraped and be gone away. Total devastation because you're rejoicing about what's happening to Israel. So uh, we know that has happened historically. I'll get to that in a moment. But he lays out what, ha what, what he's going to do, and now he talks about how it's going to happen. Look at verse 7. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will bring against Tyre from the north Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, king of kings with horses, with chariots, with horsemen, with an army, and with many people. 
He will with the sword, he will slay with the sword rather than your daughter villages, that is those that are outside your walls. That'll be easy in the fields. He will heap up a siege mound against you, build a wall against you, and raise a defense against you. Now, this is interesting because now we're going to see kind of a combination. Remember, in prophecy, God combines things. God sees everything as though it's happening at one time. And so it's important that we know prophecy and where everything falls in proper chronology or we won't understand what God's talking about. Let me give a history first of what happened to this region. Then when we read it, you'll see how it's overlapping between Babylon and Greece, Alexander the Great. What happened was Babylon came in, like God said, we now know historically, and laid a siege against Tyre. They easily took the outside villages and places of Tyre. That's the daughter villages that he talks about. And they laid up a siege for 13 years. And it took them 13 years to break through the walls of Tyre. Now, why did it take so long? They were on the coast. Tyre is right above Israel on the Mediterranean. You have Tyre and Sidon on the Mediterranean is where they were. So they were able to get, you know, they had ships and Babylon didn't have ships. They were, they were a land army. They didn't build a navy, although they were ruling the world. They didn't have a, a navy. And so Tyre did. So Tyre's ships would go in and out and with the walls blocking to where they couldn't get to the ocean, they, they couldn't do anything against them. And so what they did, unbeknownst to um, Babylon in their 13-year siege outside the city trying to starve them out, there's an island that was just a short distance off of the shore uh, from Tyre out there in the Mediterranean. And so what they started doing was they started slowly over the years moving all of their stuff and building a brand new city off the coast on this little island. Because they started thinking eventually what's going to happen is they're going to bust in, they'll get us, and so we're in trouble because this is the mighty uh, Babylonian army. They rule the world right now. And so they, they built an island out there. They moved all their stuff to the island. By the time Nebuchadnezzar broke through after his 13-year siege, there were only a few soldiers inside that were there kind of manning the fort. Um, the, the majority of the people and all those that had lived there had moved to this island. Of course, he was furious. They didn't have any boats to get to them. No, no way they could you know, do anything to them by that time. And uh, so he basically went home without any, you know, any reward, uh, anything from the city or whatever. And so he was very frustrated, if you will. So it talks here about the siege, but then now it goes on after this. And notice verse 9, he will direct his battering rams against your walls. And with his axes, he will break down your towers. So again, eventually he broke in. Because the abundance of his horses, their dust will cover you. Your walls will shake at the noise of the horsemen. The wagons and the chariots, when uh, he enters your gates... As men enter a city that has been breached, with the hooves of horses, he will trample all of your streets, and he will slay your people with the sword, and your strong pillars will fall to the ground. Now, again, there were only a few people that were in there, a few soldiers, and now we're starting to see kind of a, a, a breach over into the next group that came in and eventually did conquer um, Tyre, and that was Alexander the Great. Um, after the Medo-Persian Empire... Uh, Alexander the Great, this is some 240 years later after Babylon had laid siege, Alexander was conquering the entire world. And so as Alexander was coming down from the north and conquering everything in his path, he came to Babylon, you know, saw that it was nobody was there, uh, broke through the walls very quickly again. They'd kind of rebuilt some of it. He, he, he got in very quickly into that portion of it. And after finding that he broke into, uh, looked into Babylon that had been conquered, nobody was there, he saw that off on the coast, or, or not broke into Babylon, but broke there into Tyre, he saw off the coast that the Tyre had built the city there out into the water. And, um, and, uh, and again, he, was, he wanted to conquer everything. He didn't want anything to be remaining that he couldn't conquer. So he was like, we're going to conquer that. And so what did he do? He commanded all of his soldiers and the slaves and those that he had conquered and brought with him. He said, I want you to take every single stone, everything that is in the city, ancient city of Tyre, and build me a road out to this island. And so in seven months... They built a road out in the ocean that went all the way to this island they had built there off of the coast. Again, it just shows you the tenacity and the genius and the uh, unrelenting uh, nature of Alexander the Great. Uh, during that time, uh, as he was going out there, he had some battering rams, and he was pushing the battering rams toward the walls. And, of course, they, they, they tried to fought against the battering rams, caught them on fire, did all these kind of things, made Alexander even madder. Uh, he ended up getting some of the navy from Cyprus, and from other areas, I think from Sidon, uh, possibly, if I remember correctly. And he had some other, a couple other countries gave him some of their navy. And he was taking them over anyway, so he was ruling them. And, and he was able to come in and conquer from the other side. But the bottom line is, he finally built the wall up there, broke into the walls there of Tyre uh, at, in seven months after a 13-year siege by Babylon. And went in and just wiped everybody out. He took some slaves, but he wiped out thousands 
of the Tyrrhenians just in his anger and his fury and, of course, conquered them and overtook them. And so understanding that history, now when you read this, you can see how these begin to overlap. It kind of moves from this Babylon conquering the city but not conquering the full uh, city that had been moved out into the water. Notice what it says there in verse 12. They will plunder your riches and pillage your merchandise. Nebuchadnezzar didn't get that. The merchandise and, the, and all that came, that was with Alexander when he got in, the riches and, and uh, pillage. And they will break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. They will lay your stones, your timber, and your soil in the midst of the water. Now remember, this was all prophesied before Alexander did it. So Alexander didn't say, hey, by the way, it says in Ezekiel that we're going to be throwing all the tire into the water. And so we got to, we got to fulfill Ezekiel 26. So I want to get all my army and all the slaves and soldiers get out there and take everything and start throwing the water. No, he didn't know this at all. But God prophesied that's what would happen, and that's exactly what happened. And by the way, that's why he says it's going to be scraped. There's not going to be anything left because they took every single rock they could find, every stone, everything to build that road that went out into the water. He says, I will put an end to the sound of your songs, and the sound of your harps shall be heard no more. I will make you like the top of a rock. Again, there's nothing there but rock. It's just nothing. You should be a place for spreading nets, that is for fishermen, and you shall never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, says the Lord. And here's where the overlap comes in as well. By the way, still today, you see fishermen spread their nets there on the ancient rocks of Tyre, but there's no city there, even as God said. Now, when Babylon left, this wasn't fully fulfilled. So it looked as though, you know, hey, is this prophecy going to be completely fulfilled? Well, of course we know that it's going to be, but it was 240 years later when Alexander came through. Then Alexander, of course, wiped them out completely. And now we have the fulfillment of this prophecy here out of Ezekiel chapter 26. Exactly as God said it would happen, it did indeed happen. He says, thus says the Lord God to Tyre, will the, will the coastlands not shake at the sound of your fall? When the wounded cry, when slaughter is made in the midst of you, then all the princes of the sea will come down from their thrones, lay aside their robes, take off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They will sit on the ground, tremble every moment and be astonished at you. And they will take up a lamentation for you and say to you how you have perished, O inhabited by the seafaring, O one inhabited by the seafaring men, O renowned city, who was a strong at sea, she and her inhabitants, who caused their terror to be on, on all her inhabitants. Now the coastlands tremble, and on the day of your fall, yes, the coastlands by the sea are troubled by your departure. And again, we're going to see when we get into chapter 27, they had a very strong military, that a, a, a fairly strong navy, if you will, because being right there on the coast, they hired out their military, and they got some of the best military. They were a very wealthy city, extremely rich and wealthy. And we're going to get into the rich and the wealth. You talk about a beautiful vacation ocean town. This would have been a beautiful vacation ocean town to go to in its heyday. And we'll see that when we get into chapter 27. But because of, that, they, because of that, they had a lot of money. And of course, they had a lot of ships coming in, bringing all their wares from all over the world. They were a great distribution area. And because of this, again, they became very, very wealthy, all right? Very rich, again, which can be a downfall of any people. And it was certainly part of the downfall of Tyre. But that's what he's talking about here when he says, you were strong at sea. Uh, you made the inhabitants terrorized. They had a strong army and a strong navy. Uh, not strong enough on land for Babylon and certainly not strong enough for Alexander. But for everyone else, they were a very formidable force. He says, for thus says the Lord your God, when I make you a desolate city like the cities that are not inhabited, when I bring the deep upon you and the great waters cover you, then I will bring you down with those who descend into the pit. Now guys, note that. As you go through the Old Testament, you're going to see this terminology about descending down into the pit. Don't just pass over that. That is not just... Um, picturesque language to talk about going down to, you know, uh, Hades or whatever. Uh, the Bible refers to the center of the earth as the pit. All through the Old Testament, it talks about the pit. And that's where Hades is. That's where Tartarus is. That's where paradise was when Jesus descended for three days and three nights. Different compartments, uh, one paradise, one not so paradise, which was Hades, uh, one that holds the fallen angels. Uh, we see that in Revelation and in Second Peter. Um, and it basically a holding tank. So a picture of the center of the earth is kind of like, it's that place where they put all the drunks before they get up the next day and have to go stand before the judge. That's really what the center of the earth is. It's a place where everybody would go and be held until they went before the judge. Now, in paradise, the believers were down there in paradise prior to the cross because remember, nobody could go to heaven until Jesus died on the cross. Jesus said himself when he came to the earth, no one has seen the Father but the Son. So we know by Jesus' own words, nobody had ever gone to heaven yet by that point. Where were they, right? They were in paradise. And they were, that's the center of the earth, separate compartment from 
these other holding tanks, which is the whole area referred to as the pit. Uh, again, how do you have a paradise at the center of the earth? Well, God can do that. And God did it. And that's why he told the man on the cross, because uh, we know when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't descend back up into heaven until 40 days after his resurrection. So it was 43 days after he was on the cross that he went back to heaven. And yet he said to the man on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So where was that? Remember Ephesians 4, he descended to the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Um, he didn't go to hell and fight demons. There's some false teachings out there like that. He didn't go to Hades or whatever. He went to paradise and shared with the believers, Abraham, David, I almost said Linus. I don't know why I said Linus. I have a lot of Snoopy toys in my house now. Linus was not there. <laughs> Ezekiel, Jeremiah, etc. cetera. Um, and, and just was there with him for three days. Again, rejoicing, letting him know I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting on. And what he did, we don't know. We would have all the details of what happened. But it does tell us in Hebrews and other places that he was down there uh, preaching to the spirits in prison. And that's what, when you see in the Old Testament, I want you to recognize this. Every time you read the pit, that's what it's talking about, the center of the earth. And so you'll recognize that as you go through the Old Testament. It's in numerous places, and you begin to see it. It kind of opens up the understanding when you know what it is he's talking about. It's not just picturesque language as, oh, you're going to die. No, it's an actual place. You will go with those who descend into the pit to the lowest, uh, to the people of old. I will make you dwell in the lowest parts of the earth. In the place desolate from antiquity, with those who, who go down to the pit, so you may never be inhabited. I will establish glory in the land of the living. I will make you a terror, and you shall be no more. Though you are sought for, you will never be found again, says the Lord God. And so, by the way, people are held there in the pit until judgment day, where they'll come up and be judged by God. And in case you don't know this, I want to make sure I don't want to kind of leave you hanging, because you might be thinking, well, where is hell? Well, we don't know where hell is. Hell is the, the hell that we would think of, we refer to growing up as somebody goes to hell if they don't know God. The Bible calls that the lake of fire. And it's referred to in Scripture as Gehenna, a separate word that's used from Hades. It's called Gehenna in Scripture. Jesus referred to Gehenna, but it's also called the lake of fire. Um, it would appear that the lake of fire has already been created. We don't know where it is. It's somewhere in outer darkness. Um, and no one is currently in it. So technically, no one is in hell in what we think of as the lake of fire or eternal hell. Nobody's there yet. The Revelation tells us the first two to go into hell will be the false prophet and the antichrist. They will be in there for a thousand years by themselves. And then Satan will be thrown in third at the end of that thousand years. And then everyone else who's in the pit, that holding tank, will be thrown in after that. And then the eternal lake of fire will be inhabited for eternity, as, as the Bible taught. So there's a chronology to all of this you need to understand um, in the way that it works. Now, again, I will say this. Uh, while, while I say that no one is in hell yet, Hades is not a fun place. If you want to know a little bit more about Hades, go see what Jesus said about it in Luke 16, where he talks about the rich man and Lazarus. And we see Lazarus went to paradise. He's doing great. He's there with Abraham, it tells us. Jesus tells us in that. Uh, it's not a parable, because in, uh, in parables, the Lord never used any real names. It was all just a man sowed seed. A person did this, a whatever. Whenever God names a name, it's real. And he said, Lazarus died, and the angels escorted him to paradise. And then he said, a rich man died. And you say, well, why didn't he name the rich man? It's interesting. The Bible says that the, the name of the unrighteous will not be remembered. Isn't that interesting? That's why he says the rich man. But Lazarus, he's a believer. He'll be remembered. They go to the center of the earth, into this pit that we talked about. One of them is paradise, supernaturally protected somehow. Um, and the other compartment is Hades. It's a very hot, very uncomfortable, very miserable. It's a horrible place to be until judgment day. And then it only gets worse after that into the lake of fire. But how do we know that? Because the rich man says, I'm tormented in this heat. I'm tormented in this flame. And, um, and so that whole back and forth. is so. And then we see Lazarus, uh, we see the rich man talking to Abraham. And so what it shows us is they can see each other. In those compartments, they were able to see each other. They were able to talk back and forth, but there was this force field wall. Is the only way I know to describe it. We don't know how exactly what it was. We know it was see-through. Kind of reminds me of the old Star Trek. You know, they kind of went, boom, kind of hit it, whatever, you know, this kind of thing. And you couldn't pass back and forth between them, but they could talk. Can you imagine realizing that you had rejected Jesus Christ and your opportunity for salvation after all the times people had told you about it, suddenly by surprise, you die. And there you are in Hades. 
and you see other family members or friends maybe that have already died before you over there or people you've known or even just believers and you realize I'm done for forever. And, all you, and you can see them in paradise. You can talk to them. And to realize that their future is only going to be better because the Lord took them from a manufactured paradise and heart of the earth into the real heaven, which is where they are now. The Bible says now um, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So when we die, we go straight to be with the Lord. Those in Hades, they're still there. The rich man in the story of the rich man and Lazarus from Luke 16, he's still there. Nero, all the Caesars, they're there. Everyone that died from the start of mankind, that died without believing in the promised Messiah, um, before they knew that there was, he was going to be called the Messiah, they, they, they believed in the promised seed that God talks about there in Genesis. In the garden, he told them there will be a seed. That's the promised Messiah. We call him now, and he'll be the savior of the world. So everyone knew the gospel from the beginning. Started out just knowing he would be someone, then referred to as the Messiah later and all this. Um, everyone who ever has died is there now. And everyone who dies today will go there. Everyone who dies all the way up until the end of Jesus coming back and a thousand years, they'll go there. This place is very full and it's going to be very populated. And you might say, well, how can they all fit in there? They're just spirits. They don't have any bodies yet, but they will be given an, an eternal body, even as we will be given an eternal body. And uh, they will live forever, even as we are going to. The question is just where. Uh, now you know why when Paul says we plead with men everywhere to be reconciled to God. Um, when you really understand what's really going on, if that doesn't sober you up, nothing will. But then when you realize how wonderful it is for the believer, um, because although Linus may not be there, Snoopy for sure is. <laughs> and his head's up with his feet dancing. That's your future. That's your future. That is exciting. Yes, it's grievous to our family and friends that we love if they won't listen. But how exciting to know what our future is. And I better be quiet or we'll never get through three chapters. I felt that needed some explanation, so I'll trust that was the Lord. Chapter 27. Again, we now look at Tyre. Talking more about the details of Tyre. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Now, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyre, and say to Tyre, You who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples, on many coastlands, thus says the Lord God. O Tyre, you have said, I'm perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the midst of the sea. So again, a beautiful ocean town. Your builders have perfected your beauty. Now, remember, they were able to bring the wealthiest materials from all over the world because they were a seaport. And they were able to hire the wealthiest craftsmen and have them. I mean, I mean it was extravagant. Imagine extravagant. Uh, you think of some of these places where rich people go today that you hear about or whatever the case might be. This place was like super, super extravagant. He says, your builders, uh, your borders were in the midst of the sea. Your builders have perfected your beauty. Look what he talks about now, just their, their ships. Look at the, imagine these ships in your mind. They made all your planks, that is for your ships, of fir trees from Sinir. They took a cedar from Lebanon. That was one of the most, again, these beautiful, gigantic, 200 feet tall, some of these um, uh, uh, cedars of Lebanon, they said. And you make a mast. They would take these, the, the mast of these cedars, and they would be able to put them at the very bottom of the ship and run them all the way up through the lower deck, up through the upper deck, all the way to the top, one big tall tree, and make these beautiful, just strong, healthy ships and these strong masts and all from these cedars that came from Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon, they were actually in Lebanon. That was their area. So they had all that beautiful lumber right there that was used to build the temple and all these other things as well. He says, of oaks from Bashan, they made your oars. So they would take the oaks there in the Israel region of Bashan. That's uh, the, the, the Golan Heights area today is the Bashan region there. They have lots of oaks there. They look a little different than our trees, but again, a solid, strong oak. Again, makes a very good oar for their ships. The company of Asherites, look at this, have inlaid your planks with ivory from the coast of Cyprus. Imagine the ship, the deck of the ship. You have a plank and some ivory, a plank and some ivory, a plank and some ivory. In your nice little deck shoes walking across it, right? Your deck sandals walking across it. Beautiful. With ivory from the coast of Cyprus. Now he talks about the sails. Listen to the sails of their ships. 
fine embroidered linen from Egypt. So they take linen from Egypt, that, that wonderful area that grows that great cotton, um, and they would embroider it. They'd make it very decorative and embroidered, very special, valuable, precious. Um, uh, still, still, Egypt still has some of the best um, linens and, and, uh, and, and, and cotton materials that you can find in the world. He said they would take it, they would make it beautiful with embroidery. It was what you spread for your sale. So these beautiful ships inlaid with ivory and all the beautiful wood and the, the, the beautiful mass of the trees that were special to that area. Then they would take their sails and their sails would be this beautiful embroidered, just decorative, you know, um, uh, sails that are on the ships. And here's the part that I love. Look at this. That's was how, that was how you spread your sail. Blue and purple from the coasts of Elisha was what covered you. The blue and the purple would come from a very, a very special snail out in the ocean that they found in certain regions, very hard to harvest. You couldn't just go get purple in that day or blue in that day. Certain colors you could get, it was harder to get others. Purple was the hardest because you had to get it from this shell, this, this tiny little snail. And so they, they're still there today, but now we can make purple so they don't have to do that. But you would take, you'd have to gather up masses of these snails, these tiny snails, they would crush them. They would take the purple from those snails and they would dye their sails, right? Um, snail sails with purple and blue and all this, and hoist them up. Now, if you've seen the shirts we did here recently, they call them comfort colors, you know, the nice kind of, just those you know, almost like beachy looking colors. If you've been down to the Destin area or other up toward, um, um, you know, um, this Rosemary area, the, the Alice area, the, you know, right before you get to Panama or, or some of that, um, you know, some of those are seaside area. They have all these, you know, whites and blues and real beachy looking things and all these, they have these, those comfort colors, those beautiful purples and all these things, whatever. It would have been just a beautiful beach town. I love going there just at seaside to see all the beautiful colors of the shirts and the shoes and it's just, it's really nice. Imagine having all the ships out in the water wearing, wearing those shirts. It's like, man, look at those comfort boats. You see a beautiful purple sail, you know, blowing in the wind and just gorgeous, you know, beautiful blue and all the colors from the extravagant things that they could get. Purple typically only kings wore because it was so expensive and so hard to get from these snails. But they were right there on the ocean. They were able to get it from all over the world. And they had this just abundance of beautiful colors. We take it for granted today. Remember, they didn't have that ability. So again, it, this would have been a stunning, wealthy town, beautiful. Inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad were your oarsmen. Your wise men, O Tyre, were in you. They became your pilots. Elders of Gibal and its wise men were in, uh, were in you to caulk your seams. So you had the, you know, the greatest workers, if you will, to, take, to, to work on your buildings and your ships and all your things. All the ships of the sea and their oarsmen were in you to market your merchandise. So you, you again, very wealthy from all the merchandise you exchanged. Those from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. So they would go and they would hire, they had all this money, they would hire the, 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 the you know, mercenaries and some of the most talented you know, uh, military in the region to protect their city. And they had the money to do it. So we're gonna bring in some of the best military from Persia, some of the best military from Lydia, guys that again, that could hire themselves out, their countries would let them do that. Uh, they weren't active in the military at the time. So they had a great war around them and a great army around them, their own land. They also had, of course, all their ships at sea. So they were, they were very strong militarily. It's just that Nebuchadnezzar on land was much stronger because God made him that way. And Alexander was much stronger overall because God allowed him to grow to that strength, if you will. But again, these guys were very formidable. They would have been one of the top, uh, probably armies of the day today and one of the wealthiest, most beautiful cities you could ever imagine. Uh, again, these, the army, those that came there and lived there from Persia, Lydia, and Libya, look at it, it says they hung their shield and helmet in you, so they stayed there. They gave splendor to you, so no doubt their uniforms were beautiful, and they were probably looked really, you know, just really, you know, I doubt they were walking around wearing fatigues. You know, it would appear they were wearing these beautiful uniforms and their soldiers and whatever, but everything was just done up to the hilt. Men of Arvad, they gave splendor to you, he says. Men of Arvad with your army were on your walls all around. All the men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung their shields on your walls all around you and they made your beauty perfect. Now remember this, the fact that they have all this beauty and it's glorious, this is working toward something we're coming to later. The king of Tyre who's behind the scenes giving them, helping them get all this wealth, helping them to look so beautiful, helping them to present themselves as something gorgeous. But what God is gonna say is you may look beautiful on the outside, but you're corrupted on the inside. And so we're going to see this whole changeover where God begins to talk about what they really are. They may look good on the outside, but they're corrupt on the inside. Tarshish was your merchant because of your many luxury goods, either Spain or, or Britain. 
They gave you silver, iron, tin, and lead for your goods. Javan, Tubal, and Meshach were your traders. So they're trading with all these areas, even Russia, which is Tubal and Meshach. They bartered human lives, so they were uh, uh, you know, trafficking in slavery, maybe other things, but no doubt slavery. They bartered human lives and vessels of bronze uh, for your merchandise. Those from the house of Tagarma traded for your wares. Um, then that's, again, the, the whole uh, Balkan region, Tagarma. Traded for your wares with horses, steeds, and mules. The men of Dedan, now we're getting into the Saudi Arabia area, Saudi Arabia area rather. The men of Dedan were your traders. Many isles were the markets of your hand, or the market of your hand. They brought you ivory tusks and ebony as payment. So they're getting the wealthiest things of the earth. Syria uh, was your merchant because of the abundance of goods that you made. They gave you and your, uh, and your wares emeralds, purple, embroidery, fine linen, corals, and rubies. Judah and the land of Israel were your traders. So they were involved as well in all your commerce. They traded for your merchandise of wheat and minneth, a millet, honey, oil, and balm. So again, a lot of goods come through there, but also a lot of food transported. So again, everything that the ocean could bring would be there. Damascus was your merchant because of the abundance of the goods you made, because of your many luxury items, with the wine of Hebron, of Rahelbon rather, and with white wool. Dan and Javon paid for your wares, traversing back and forth. Wrought iron, cassia, and cane were among your merchandise. You, basically, you could buy anything. If you wanted to go and find anything you wanted for your mansion, the place to go was Tyre. I mean, they had everything you could ever imagine. The shops would have been amazing. It would have just been an incredible place even just to visit. He says, Dedan was your merchant in saddlecloth for riding. Arabia, no, saddlecloths for riding. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar were your regular merchants. They traded with you in lambs, rams, and goats. The merchants of Sheba, uh, Sheba and Ramah Re were your merchants. They traded for your wares and your choice spices, all kinds of precious stones and gold. Haran, Cana, Eden, and merchants of Sheba, Assyria, and Chilmad were your, mer were your merchants. These were your merchants in choice items in purple clothes. Again, that's the wealthiest of the wealthy right there. In purple clothes, in embroidered garments, in chests of multicolored apparel, in sturdy woven cords, which were in your marketplace. The ships of Tarshish were carriers of your merchandise. They were filled, they were filled and very glorious in the midst of the seas. Your oarsmen brought you into many waters, but the east wind broke you in the midst of the sea. Now the east wind is used idiomatically throughout the scriptures as God's judgment. So God is saying, although you thought you were wonderful, I broke you. In the midst of your beauty, the thing that you thought you were thriving in, I brought you down because of your rebellion to God. The east wind broke you in the midst of the seas. Your riches, your wares and merchandise, your mariners and pilots, your caulkers and merchandisers, all the men of war who are in you and the entire company which is in your midst will fall into the midst of the seas. Quite literally, they did. Remember what happened. Everything was scraped into the ocean to build that road for Alexander to go out and conquer them out there on that island. This will happen on the day of your ruin. The common land will shake at the sound of the cry of your pilots. All who handle the oar, the mariners, all the pilots of the sea will come down from their ships and stand on the shore. They will make their voice heard because of you. They will cry bitterly and cast dust on their heads, which again, how they mourned in the Middle East. They will roll about in ashes. They will shave themselves completely bald because of you. These are all signs of mourning. Gird, uh, gird themselves with sackcloth and weep for you with bitterness of heart and bitter wailing. Now, why were they weeping and wailing for Tyre? Because that's how they made all their money as well. It's like, hey, we're sorry you guys are gone because we were getting rich off of you. And this was a great place to, do, to sell our stuff and, and to buy stuff and all these things, and we hate that it's gone. You'd be like if, you know, again, I, I don't know that, um, how many people love New York City anymore, but back when New York City was in its heyday, you know, just this amazing, you know, whatever, imagine suddenly, boom, it's just blown up in one day and gone. It'd be like, man, I, you know, the people that were just into the things would be, would be sad that they couldn't go and, you know, go to a city like New York City anymore. So it's kind of that idea. Oh, and they weep for you with bitterness of heart and bitter, weep, bitter wailing. And they're waiting for you. They will take up a lamentation and lament for you. What city is like Tyre? Destroyed in the midst of the sea. When your wares went out by sea, you satisfied many people. You enriched the kings of the earth with your many luxury goods and your merchandise. But you are broken by the seas in the depths of the waters. Your merchandise and the entire company will fall in your midst. All the inhabitants of the isles will be astonished at you. Their kings will be greatly afraid and their countenance will be troubled. The merchants among the peoples will hiss at you. You will become a horror and be no more forever. And again, that's exactly what's happened. 
Tyre, ancient Tyre no longer exists. It's not there. It's been scraped. It's gone. As I said, there's a small city that was built some distance away that now calls itself Tyre because it's in that proximity, a small town. But Tyre that God is speaking of here has been wiped out, no longer exists. And God said that it never would exist again, that it never would be rebuilt. And that's why that region has never been rebuilt because God said it wouldn't. Now chapter 28, we are going to be able to do it. This is great. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Now, this is like the, the leader of the city. Okay, we'd say the governor or whatever. Prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God. Now, now, look what this guy thinks about himself. We get some insight into him because of all the wealth and all the beauty and all the glory. It has now gone to his head. He's now thinking more highly of himself than he ought because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God and I sit in the seat of of gods in the midst of the seas. Now, let's just stop there before I read the rest of it. Is that not reminiscent of what's, of what's happening today? I mean, that's happening today. I mean, you guys have heard this with the World Economic Forum. You've all know Harari. He's saying, he, you know, that we will become gods. He's saying now with this new technology, mankind will become gods. It'll kind of be like, you know, the, whole, the, the Marvel thing with the Captain America, or whatever. You'll be able, they'll be able to do something to you genetically or modify you by uh, whatever mechanics or whatever they use and make you superhuman or whatever. They're even talking about trying to download the stuff from your brain into another computer so that you can have it another body when you die and download it into that body and keep living forever. They're trying to get around God's judgment every way they can. They're talking about this very openly. Elon Musk has talked about downloading people's brains, you know, and keeping that material, and that, and that would keep you downloaded into someone else younger, and you could still live in a, in a, a new body I think they can make in a lab or whatever. They're talking about making bodies people could live. I mean, it gets bizarre when you hear what these guys are talking about. And they're very open about it. These, if you watch the World Economic Forum, listen to Elon Musk, and they talk about it openly. It's not some hidden secret. But again, they're openly talking about one day we will be gods. Guys, where, whose voice is that? What did Satan say to Eve in the garden? You will be like God. So it's the same lie repackaged over and over. And if you think today, wow, people are saying we can be gods today. Listen, this has been going on for a long time. It was going on back in Tyre. It was going on before Tyre, all the way back to the garden. Remember, it was, was it back in the 80s uh, when the whole Shirley MacLaine and that whole group were saying they were gods, you know, and, and you just had to figure out you were a god or whatever and this kind of thing. And, and just, it's so ridiculous. I mean, if you're a God, you know, then you should be able to just appear in one place and appear in another place. You didn't have to ever walk. Um, you can just create things you want to create. It's nonsense what Satan can make people believe, but they really convinced themselves they were gods, somehow connected to whatever this case might be. The, the whole spiritism, you know, the whole Christ consciousness, new age type stuff. That's exactly what's happening here. He says, you say I'm a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas. He's, he's hearing the lies of Satan, but God corrects him. <laughs> Yet you are a man and not a God. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. Again, the two great truths, you know, throughout eternity, there's one God and we aren't him. You know, he alone is God. God said, says all through the scripture, you know, and multiple times, you know, in, in, in Isaiah chapters like 40 through 46 or whatever, you know, I am God and there is no other. That settles it. And yet they believe they can be God. It's amazing. And again, we see it today, uh, people that still, even again, like with modern day, it, sometimes I think we kind of forget, like even the Mormons, they, they believe they one day will be a God. So it's not, it's, it's not something that's that unusual when the new age popped up. The Mormons have been doing it for a long time. Hinduism has been saying it for a long time. Um, now that the World Economic Forum, they're all starting to say you know, this kind of same thing. It's the same spirit. It's just in different packages. He says, though, though you set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, you're wiser than Daniel. <laughs> He's mocking him. It's a mockery. He's not really saying he's wiser than Daniel. He said, oh, you must be wiser than Daniel, the one that I gave all the visions and the dreams to you. You know nothing. Daniel wasn't even a god, and yet I showed Daniel dreams and visions and things you'll never even begin to understand. There's no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you've gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. Now, you did a, nobody helped you. you. You pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. You made, you're a self-made man. Yeah, right. God, the Bible says God gives us everything that we have. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. And therein lies the danger of riches. Look, riches can be a great blessing. And I know people that have a lot of money and they're humble. It doesn't mean you're prideful because you have riches. Riches can be a huge blessing. Abraham was one of the wealthiest men on the planet. Jacob became very wealthy as well. You look at the, the men of God uh, oftentimes became very wealthy. So it's not, money's not the issue. 
But if you allow it to go to your head and you think because of it you're better than everybody else or you're special, that's the problem. He says, now pride has taken over. You've lifted yourself up. You don't remember that you're only a man. That's it. And your heart's lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of nations. In other words, I'm going to show you that you're not a God by bringing you down by men. They shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit. There's the pit again. And you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Again, they were thrown into the sea by Alexander. Will you still say before him who slays you, I'm a God? Are you still going to say that to me when I wipe you out, that you're a God? But you shall be a man and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised, that is unbeliever. By the hand of aliens, this will happen. He's saying, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Now, that's the prince of Tyre. Now, it shifts gears to the part I wanted to get to tonight, and that is who is behind the prince of Tyre, and that is the king of Tyre. We talked about behind every world system, every world leader that doesn't follow God, there's demonic influence. There's demonic power. There are these, in Daniel, it talks about these, um, these demons, these fallen angels that are actually called princes and kings, that reign over Iran and Syria, and no doubt we have one over America and all that. And again, if you're a believer, you're not under their authority and power. You're free from that. But the Bible says, remember in the scripture, that those who don't know the Lord, the entire world, it says, is under the sway of the evil one. That's they're under the sway of Satan. And it's done either by Satan himself, by you know, regional power, or it's done by the regional kings and princes, these fallen angels that he puts in place in different areas. And Tyre was no different. Tyre had a king in the spirit realm behind the prince who was really running the show. The prince was a pawn. He was just being used. And, and because uh, Satan was working through him, he thought that he was the one that had all this splendor, that he had made all this greatness. No, it was because of the, the influence of Satan and the deception of Satan. And now we're going to see that Satan indeed is this king of Tyre behind him. Uh, but it's, it not only is that kind of an interesting insight to see how the enemy works behind the scenes, but also we're going to learn some things about Satan that are really amazing and give us some great insight. And so now let's jump into it. He says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him. Now we're going to find out, obviously it's not a man because the way he's described here makes it very clear this is a supernatural being. Thus say to him, thus says the Lord God. So you make this proclamation to Satan. He's telling Ezekiel to make this proclamation prophetically now to Satan. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Just stop there for a moment. This is talking about Satan. He was the seal, in God's eyes, the seal of perfection, perfect in beauty. Now think of some things that are beautiful to you, whether it be a person or a place or whatever, or a thing. It's not perfect. It may look perfect, but in the fallen world it can't be. But Satan was in heaven at this time, as God's describing, he was perfect. His beauty was extravagant. Now, whatever your image is of Satan, you need to reset it if it's not this. And this is where a lot of people stumble because they don't realize we're dealing with someone that's extremely beautiful and deceptive in their beauty and how they present things to us, you know, um, and they make it seem beautiful. Satan can make sin seem beautiful until the consequences come, and then we know that it's not. But the whole you know, picture of this, and yes, in heart, he is the ugly imagery that you see all the time, you know, of all these demonic things and all that. But the Bible says he, he works as an angel of light. He's beautiful in appearance. That's why uh, even the Antichrist, when he comes behind the Antichrist, and the Antichrist comes on the scene, the way he's supporting the Prince of Tyre here, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's going to be just handsome and attractive, and the world's going to go, wow, what authority and what what beauty and what just, oh, there's, there's something about him, you know, or whatever. And the world's going to be enamored by this guy. And you see a lot of people that, that, that the enemy gives this kind of glory, if you will. They last for a short amount of time because it goes to their head and then God brings them down. But um, again, try to imagine what Satan is like. And I say is like, because he's still this way. Now his heart is ugly and dark, but he's a, an amazingly beautiful. Matter of fact, it could be possible that aside from the Lord himself, he might be the most beautiful created thing that God ever made. 
And that's what this bears out. It gives a picture of something that is so incredibly stunning in beauty. You think about it. What would it take to get a third of the angels to believe you could take God and they'd want to follow you rather than God? How beautiful would you have to be? How seemingly powerful would you have to be? How persuasive in your charisma, your character, the way you can get people to gather to you and follow you because of all this, whoa, you're perfect, everything, you know, just wow. Listen to the description of this guy. He was some handsome devil. I've been waiting all day for that. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Now, did he wear them or were they him? Think about that for a minute. I don't know. I kind of doubt that he had to put something on. My guess is he is made out of precious jewelry stones. That's his very body. It's made of precious jewelry stones. Could be something you put on. I don't think so. I think we're going to be taking things on and off in heaven. I think you're just going to, it is what it is. Imagine a being that's made out of all the most beautiful, precious jewels that God can create in the glory of God in heaven, untainted. And that's who he is. He, he comes walking up. He is a walking jewel. That's just stunning when you think about it. The sardius, the topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. What did he look like when he walked in the glory of God in heaven? All those colors going through those beautiful, pure jewels. The other angels had to be going, whoa. No wonder you're the cherub that covers. Oh, my goodness. What, when God made you, and there wouldn't have been jealousy in their hearts. You know, the ones that fell, there would have been. But the ones that were pure, they'd be just going, man, wow. You know? Notice this. He says, The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, onyx, turquoise, the workmanship, well, turquoise and emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day that you were created. Now, here's some of the note. He's a created being. God is the creator. He was created. But notice this. When it talks about all these beautiful jewels, it also says something else, else about his body. His body is an instrument. So he walks up, floats up, flies up, and he's got all these beauty, this unbelievable, stunning beauty and made of jewels. And just this sound comes out. Like, oh, my goodness. What instrument is he playing? He's not playing an instrument. He is the instrument. Music is powerful. It stirs us to the very soul. God knows that. God created music to stir us to the very soul. Music can be used as an amazing tool to bring glory to God that we're not even going to imagine until we get to heaven. The kind of worship we're going to have there, you can't even imagine what that's like. But you think about the worship that came out of Satan as the covering cherub. I don't know what it means by covering. I don't know that any theologian knows for sure what that means. We know there are cherub underneath the Lord's throne, one on each corner. We saw that the first chapter of Ezekiel. It's in other places as well. Maybe... Maybe Satan was kind of, you know, somewhere higher above them, floating, covering. I don't know. I don't know how that. We don't know. But he had this special honor, this special place. It, it wasn't enough. He wanted to be like God. He needed more. And, and it, was, it was his downfall. But it was all this beauty and all that deceived him. And, his, and, and the very instrument. I think about the worship coming out of him. Now, I say that. Music can be used in an amazing, wonderful way for God. But this is why you see music used so powerfully in darkness as well. Many of the, you know, mass killings and these school shootings and these teenagers, and all, they're all jacked up on this really just, you know, this thrash metal and all this kind of stuff. There's a power to it. Listen, there's nothing wrong. Music is, is from Scripture, from what we can see, music itself is amoral, okay? A, a good rock chord is not sinful. It's pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool, all right? I used to do that better back then. I can't even do it anymore. Violin, the sweetness of the sound. Um, 
But when it's used with the power of the enemy, I mean, think about it. Some believe he was the worship leader in heaven. It makes sense. And now he's here trying to make mankind fall. He used to use music to glorify God. Think where his focus would be. If he is an instrument, where would his focus be on this earth in getting people to fall away from God? In the music realm. And that's why you see so much wickedness connected to the music realm. Again, music, I'm not talking about certain kinds of music, okay? Whatever you like, as long as it honors God. But it can be used in very dark ways to dishonor God. And I can tell you, coming out of that world, and again, growing up in the concerts or whatever before I knew the Lord and that kind of stuff, I mean, Satan wants people to worship him. And there really is, as I look back now, there was a sense of worship of those guys on the stage. I, may, I probably wouldn't have admitted that. But there's this, there's something powerful about it. It causes people to stampede and knock down gates and, you know, throw their bodies at people, sell their souls, and do all these things for, for, for this. What's behind that? Is it just because the music's really cool? I don't think so. I think there's a demonic power behind a lot of this stuff that is really drawing in people to worship, all age groups. And I think it ultimately is Satan getting people to, to worship him. Turn to me, give me the glory. And he's giving and using that musical influence, I think, to, to draw out gifts that God gave to be used for his glory. Think of all these people that God gave these amazing gifts. And God gave these people these amazing gifts to be used for God. Satan was able to turn them around and have them used for Satan, which is what he wants. He wants to be worshiped. So be very wise. Uh, you know, I, 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 when it comes to music, you know, it's not a sin to listen to something that's not Christian. I'm not saying that. I mean, there's a lot of great music, you know. Uh, no, jazz isn't one of them, but there's a lot of other. <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended some of you, but. That fusion stuff, like, confusion is what I call it, but anyway. But it's how the music is used. It's how it's used. Is it glorifying God? What are the words and what's the spirit behind it? Guys, there's a spirit behind music. So don't, just, don't judge music just by the kind of music that it is. Music's amoral as far as we can tell. But it's the spirit behind whatever kind of music it is. So he's this instrument. The workmanship, again, it gives a picture of these beautiful timbrels and pipes. I mean, workmanship, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. Remember Satan said, I will ascend to the farthest sides of the north. I will walk in the mountain of God. You walk back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Well, what are the fiery stones on the mountain of God going to look like? Wow. Wow. It's like you had the privilege and honor to walk in the midst of the fiery stones of the mountain of God, and you were all these jewels, and they shine through you. Your, your splendor enamored the angels. Look at this. You were perfect in your ways, and the day you were created, he keeps reminding him, you're a created being. I'm taking you down until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, this is interesting. He uses the analogy of the merchants and all the things they sold in Tyre, right? Because that's what they were doing for all the money and all the things they were selling. But the root word in here, yes, it does mean trading, such as merchandise. But in the root word, it also means gossip and slander. Isn't that interesting? By gossip and slander, he turned a third of the angels away from God. How long did that take? How long did God give him? And why did God do it? You ever think about a church split in heaven? I don't think I can follow the leadership. I don't, I don't, I, I, guys, why are, we, why are we following God? Let's do our own thing. Follow me. Look at me. Come on. What can God do that I can't do? Well, you know, you are awfully beautiful. And you gotta, I think, how could an angel fall for that? But it shows you how beautiful that he was, right? And he literally led a rebellion in heaven, and God allowed it to happen. Why would God allow it? Because God said, all right, I'm going to see who's really with me in heart and who's not. We're going to thin out the ranks. It's interesting, when Jesus started teaching hard things, he said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part in me. He knew that would freak some people out. Sounds like cannibalism, right? But he wanted to see, do you trust me enough to know that I'm not a cannibal? Do you trust me enough to know that I'm speaking something spiritual that you don't understand yet? Do you really trust me? Do you love me? And do you trust me? He says, at that time, a group of them got up and left. The Lord didn't chase after them. Come back, come back, come back. It's just an analogy. 
we got a church growth thing going, and if you're going to go, you can go. Hey, disciples, are you going to go? Are you going to, Peter, are you going to go? I don't know what you're talking about. This whole eat flesh thing. But you hold the words of life, there's nowhere to go. I'm staying here. That's the heart I want, Peter. You love me and trust me even when you don't understand. God gave him time to convince a third of the angels to leave with him before he kicked them out. That's amazing. And I'll tell you, if you're not satisfied with that church, you'll never find one. When God is your pastor, if that's not good enough, gossip and slander has destroyed many churches throughout history, and it started in heaven, and it's always led up by guess who? Satan himself. You became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Again, he's speaking futuristically now on when, when finally Satan will be judged. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Same idea. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst and it devoured you. And I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you uh, among the peoples are astonished at you. You become a horror and shall be no more forever. So you're going to be wiped out and you're going to be done. So there's the future of Satan. But what an amazing revelation of who Satan really is. Again, great insight. We need to know who our enemy is. We don't have to study him or you know, that kind of thing. But it's good to know who our enemy is. It prepares us. And he finishes out the last few verses here, which is where we'll stop tonight, with a proclamation against Sidon, because Sidon was right there next to Tyre. Tyre and Sidon were right there together. And Sidon also is rejoicing at the demise of Israel, or they're also going to be judged. He says, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Sidon, and prophesy against her, and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm against you, O Sidon, I will be glorified in your midst. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I execute judgments in her and am hallowed in her. For I will send pestilence upon her and blood in her streets. The wounded shall be judged in her midst by the sword against her on every side. They shall know that I am the Lord. And there shall no longer be a pricking briar or painful thorn for the house of Israel from among all who are around them who despise them. Uh, so again, you're, you're, you're like a pricking thorn despising Israel. You're doing the same thing all the other peoples did. So I'm bringing you down as well, Sidon. Then they, shall, then they shall know that I am the Lord. Again, we talked about it last week. Don't mess with Israel. If you're going to do anything with Israel, be a blessing to them. It doesn't mean they're perfect. doesn't mean they're not sinners. doesn't mean they're not rejecting God because they are right now. They're a stiff-necked people. God called them that for a reason. But he said, I'm going to restore them. I'm going to revive them. In the last days, they're going to believe in Jesus and there's going to be a massive outpouring of my spirit and a revival. He said, they're the apple of my eye. You better love them. You better be kind to them. And by the way, no matter how they're acting, if you bless them, I'll bless you. Genesis 12, 3. 25, he says, thus says the Lord God, when I've gathered the house of Israel from the peoples among whom they are scattered and am hallowed in them in the sight of the Gentiles, then they will dwell in their own land, which I gave to my servant Jacob. So I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to give them the land. That's why you better quit trying to attack them because I'm going to bless them. And they will dwell safely. Again, this is talking about the thousand year reign, the millennial kingdom. They will dwell safely, build houses, plant vineyards. Yes, they will dwell securely when I execute judgments on those around them who despise them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Wow, we did it. What an amazing portion of scripture. Powerful. Guys, I, let me wrap this up. And I, again, um, we're out of time. But, you know, remember the adversary we face is very deceptive. And he, he, he's very beautiful. He, he comes across not like you think he would come across. Don't be deceived because it feels good or looks good. If it feels good or looks good and lines up with the scripture, Enjoy. If it feels good and looks good and doesn't line up with the scripture, run. Because it is a deception. I'm sure for a while, a third of the angels thought, this is awesome. We're going to take over and do the things the way that we want. Satan's on our side. We're going to follow him. We're going to do it different, right? They probably felt great for just a second. And then all of a sudden, they realized, kaboom, they're done. I said, what did we just do? How many people think sin is so wonderful until they do it? And right afterwards, they go, what have I done? Right? Same kind of thing. Don't be snookered by the enemy. Be, be wise. He's beautiful, but the Lord is more beautiful. He has some power that God has given him, but God has all power. He's created. God is the creator. Worship the Lord. I know I don't have to tell you guys that, but at the same time, guard your heart from the enemy, the deceptions of the enemy. And um, uh, again, I think it's going to be amazing. I can't wait to see 
um, when we get to see what Satan looks like. And I mean, all these things, it's going to be amazing, guys. Heaven is going to be amazing. I can't wait to see the fiery stones of the mountain of God. It's going to be amazing. Matter of fact, the Bible says you guys are going to shine like the stars of heaven. That's going to be pretty cool. You know, I might put on my sunglasses just to say hi to you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, God, that you have such a great future ahead of us. And Lord, guard us against pride. Pride and arrogance is what brought Satan down and a third of the angels with him. He allowed his beauty and his giftings and to deceive him. And Lord, again, we can be deceived if, even if we don't have beauty and giftings. We have other things that deceive us and allow pride to settle in. If we're dealing with pride in our hearts tonight, God, let us humble ourselves and realize you alone are God. You alone are beautiful. You alone are glorious. You alone will be worshiped and praised. And Lord, again, um, I thank you that you cleared heaven out of those that shouldn't be there. And I thank you, God, that you've secured a place for us, for those of us that love you. And we love your leadership, Lord. We wouldn't follow anyone else. We are content. We are satisfied. And Lord, you fill us to overflowing. I pray you would do that even now, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to overflowing. God, let us just get a glimpse of your glory and spirit of who you are and fill this place. Let us worship the God who sits among the mountain of, of the fiery stones, the beauty of heaven, and what you have planned for us in the future, Lord. I, I thank you, Lord. I pray that if there's anyone here tonight, Lord, that maybe they were convicted by some of the things we talked about and they realize they, they've never given their life to you. If that's you tonight, before you leave here, get right with God. It's very easy. Don't fight it. The Spirit's working in your heart right now. You hear it, you know it, you feel it. God's convicting you that you have sin and you need to get right with God. Just confess it. Tell God right now, I am a sinner. I'm not going to hide it. You see it, God. I can't hide it from you. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I believe that your son went to the cross and died for me on the cross. And by his blood, my sin is taken away. My sin is removed. I am forgiven and I'm clean. Lord, I choose to turn away from the life of sin I've been living. And I choose to follow you for the rest of my life and the rest of eternity. If you do that, the Bible says you'll be born again and you have your place secured in the kingdom of God. Lord, stir hearts, fill up your kingdom, fill us with your spirit, and thank you again for your word tonight. God, let it do what you sent it to do, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you guys. If you need prayer, we'll be up here.